Amen. If you're uh, if you're new with us and you, you you're maybe it's your first time or you haven't been here very many times, today is what we like to call traditional service. So this is um, kind of a throwback to the how church may have been not too long ago or a long time ago for some churches. It just depends. Uh, but we just like to honor the past from time to time. And um, so if you're wondering why people more than normal have on ties and suits and why I'm in a suit, that's why. Because I'm normally not in the suit. Uh, I am starting to get used to it, though. But not that, not that comfortable. Um, if that was your first time to ever take a Baptist communion, a Lord's Supper at a Baptist church, you, you may have figured out that we like to do things very efficiently in the Baptist church. So I know passing the plates and things like that, are, that's not the way it's done in some, some churches. But we like to be quick, fast, and efficient in the Baptist church. And I think we've got the Lord's Supper down pretty good myself, but I know it's different in some places. Uh, I do want to just bring your attention to a couple things as before we get into the, serve, or into the message. Um, if you are 21 years or over and want to serve, uh, we are back running full buses on Sunday mornings, uh, actually even running two routes right now. So we, we are ready to have some people sign up for that. We've had several uh, people sign up for that already, or a few men sign up for that, a few young men too, and we're thankful for that. So if you want to sign up for that, you can go to fbcdan.com slash sundaybus and sign up, and then we'll get a, a schedule together really soon as we get a few more people to sign up for that. Uh, this, I haven't, we haven't talked about this at all. So the Arkansas Baptist Children Family Ministries uh, has been gifted over a million dollar property, what used to be the Markham Street Baptist Church. They've been given this church uh, and they have completely renovated it, and they are completely moving all of their offices, their whole central location, out of the state building into this church on Markham Street. And there's been a lot of money and effort. We've gone down there and helped with some of it. Some of our guys, we've built some walls and stuff. Their ribbon cutting is coming up. It's on December 12th. They're having a ribbon cutting and an open house at, this, at their new location. Anyone that wants to go to that, anyone that would like to go to that, uh, we'll drive a bus down there and back that day, if anyone would like to go and be part of that. Uh, if you'll just let us know after the service, if you'll go to the Connect Center, uh, there'll be someone there to help you sign up for that. It's under Next Steps uh, on the website, so if you want to be part of that. One more thing. Uh, many of you know we took a offering in Miss Lita's name this past May, and, we, and it's a local mission offering. We're trying to look for ways that we can spread kindness and, and, and ease suffering, and most importantly, spread the gospel. Miss Lita was all about spreading the gospel, and that's why we wanted to name that mission after her. Uh, so one thing that we're doing is uh, we have partnered with the school. We've sent letters out. We've had some, some people sign up. We're going to pass out uh, 50 Thanksgiving meal boxes tomorrow to people that have signed up for that. Uh, what we need help with today, if you want to be part of that, is we're going to pack those boxes at 415 today. Uh, all of that's coming from Harps. They've got it all ready for us. So I'm going to pick it up, and we'll pack those boxes, kind of like we do in the summers. For those of you that are part of the summer food program, a little different than that, but but very similar. Um, so it'll be a good time. If you, it, I know some of you can't, and that's okay. But if you can, 4:15 today, and we'll get those boxes packed up in probably 30 minutes tops. Um, so enough of that. Let's talk about what the Lord has for us today. We are finishing a four-week series. We've been talking about being thankful. We've talked about different reasons to be thankful, and this is the, the uh, scripture that we'll be in today. If you're a note, note taker, fbcdan.com slash notes, you can take those notes right there, or you can scan that QR code, fbcdan.com slash notes. You can have my notes. If it worked today, it was being a little iffy, so if it's not there, if it's still last week, I apologize. Um, Four weeks, we've been talking about different things. Perseverance of the saints, those that are who are saved will continue to be saved and will be saved forevermore. We've talked about the Trinity, uh, which was something else. And, uh, and then we talked about the forgiveness that is unending last week. So if you missed any of those and you want to be filled in on this series, that, that's always at fbcdan.com. Today we're talking about the provision that is bountiful. The provision that is bount bountiful, being thankful for the provision that is bountiful, and we'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. Before we get into that, I'm going to pray for us. Father, I come to you today, and I ask that you would speak to me and speak through me today, God. That things that are said are what you want to be said, and anything you don't want said, that you'll close my mouth. Lord, that we you open our hearts, 
so that we would hear your word. Hear and hear your word, Lord. May it not fall on deaf ears or hard hearts, but maybe we'd be softened to the truth that is your word and to the glorious nature of your gospel, God. We thank you and we love you for all that you do for us, God. And may we walk out of here today more thankful than we've ever been for what you've done for us. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. One verse today. I know you don't believe that, but it is true. One verse today says, And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. Paul's letter, his second letter that we have to the Corinthians, and this is kind of right in the middle, towards the end of that letter. And here's what it looks like in Greek. Anybody care to read that for us? Okay. Jenny? Oh, okay, sorry. Picking on, picking on visitors. <laughs> uh, I'm showing you that for a reason. As we go through this today, you'll notice some things that would very much so jump out to you if you read that in the Greek, if you knew Greek and read that in the Greek like they did originally. Um, we catch it in the English, but the Greek, it really, there's some really parts in this that it really jumps out today. So we'll come back to that and go through that whole thing today. The first part is the very first part of this verse. The very first part of this verse. Dineteo de otheo. And God is able. This word, dineteo, it's in the New Testament often, many different ways, uh, with different endings on the end, because the ending is how you talk to a different group or a different how you tag who you're talking to. But the word dunateo there, together, it's to be powerful. It's to be mighty. Uh, it's show oneself powerful. To be able. To have power. Same word is used in Ephesians 3.20. To him who is able. Same word. To do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. God is able. He is dunateo. He's able but he's free to choose. God is free to choose whom and how and when and to what degree to which he will bless. He's fully able and fully capable. He's mighty and powerful and desires to do, to, 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 to give, to give bountifully, to provide for us all that we need. But it is up to him who he does that to, how he does it, when he does it, and to what degree to which he does it. And sometimes that's the problem we have with how God gives out his blessing. Sometimes we think uh, that someone else is being blessed and that we're doing all that we should be to be blessed. And God, why won't you bless me? And you're only blessing them. I heard a clinical psychologist say this past week, the more you think about yourself, he wasn't speaking scripturally or spiritually or anything else. This is just scientific fact. The more you think about yourself, the more miserable you will be. The more selfish we, we've, we approach the world and we approach life, the more it's about us, the more miserable, miserable, that's a hard word for me to say, miserable you will be. So God gets to choose, but God is fully capable, fully powerful, and he does want to bless us. Moving on in the Greek. Pas hadis. Perisomo es humas. Pas is all, everything, whole, always, everything that it can be. Hais is grace, the state of kindness and favor towards someone, often with a focus on a benefit given to the object. Perisomo, to have abundance, more than enough, overflow, to have an excessive amount of something, to superabound. In a quality or in quantity. Ace, the second to last word there, is to or toward or for or into. And the last word, humas, is just you. So God, who is able, He is powerful, He is capable, and has all the goodness that you can have. He is all of the grace that there is. All of these things. He has all of it and He has it all in. Abundance. He's able to make every grace overflow to you is the way that the HCSB says it. To make every grace overflow to you. The NIV says to bless you abundantly. The NLT says to generously provide. The Passion 
which be careful with that translation, but sometimes it gets it good. The Passion says, more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace. The message says, God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways. The NASB says, to make all grace abound to you. That's a very literal translation of the word perusimo. The King James Version says, to make all grace abound toward you. Using the East in a different way, but all correct. God is able to make every grace the focus of the, the kindness and favor towards someone with a focus on the benefit of the object receiving it. He has all the grace and all the power, and he wants to, he wants, he wants to bless us with that. He wants to do that. So let's think so far. We have an exceedingly powerful, mighty, and able God. That's what the Greek is telling us there. That desires to abound, to exceed, to lavishly pour out and on us his grace, his kindness, his favor, his benefits, his blessings. All right. So that's a pretty cool start to this one verse. Let's keep going because this next part, when looking at it in the Greek, is my favorite part. I, I nerded out on this a little bit. I'm not even going to pretend like I didn't. I did. So this next part in the Greek, if you'll look at it, you don't have to read Greek to be able to see similar letters. Okay, you can see those three words that are that are highlighted there. They start with similar letters. Now the third word has an omega in between the alpha and the ni, but you can see that there is a pi and an alpha and a ni. The uh, the ni is looks like a v in, in, when we write it when it's written in Greek. We would write it with an n in English. So there's a p, an a. And a V, which is really an N, Pi, Alpha, and Ni in all those words. Because it has the same root word. It's the same root word in all of those words. So when you look at it transliterated into English, you've got Hina and Pante, Pantote, Pasan. If I said that and you were a Greek listener, you would hear that repetition of that word. It would make, it would jump out. It would really catch your attention. And now it does it in the English, but I think it does it better in the Greek. We, we say it. We say everything that it's saying in the English, but we, it says it more and better, I think, in the Greek. Pante, pantote, pasan. So hina is so that. So God is fully able, fully capable, fully powerful, and has all grace. And he wants to take all of that so that, he has that, so that, pante, all, everything, whole, always. Pantote, all the time. Always. Forever, that version of the, of the word pawn. And then pasan, all, everything, whole, always. So it would be like saying, God always, always, always. He has all and always, always, always. And will all, all, all. It's, it's a repetition of a word. Remember, they didn't have the scriptures to carry around. You were speaking to and you were teaching to uh, a, an audible society. So lots of times in Scripture, there's things that are written in a way that it's very memorable when you hear it, especially in the original language. So notice here, as, as I, as I <clears throat> nerd out on the Greek a little more, notice here how often that shows up in this one verse. This one verse, the word pan, is used a few different times it's used different times with different suffixes addressed to different audiences or conjugating it a little bit differently. But five times in one verse, you have this word, pun. All, everything, all the time. The word is the same uh, that we use as a prefix in Spanish that we don't say pun most of the time, especially in the South. So we say pan. You've heard that a lot in the last two, two and a half years. Pandemic. Same word. Same meaning, pandemic, everywhere, all. Demic is, means group of peoples. So whenever there's an infection that spreads all over the world, it affects all peoples, pandemic. Same word. You think Paul is trying to drive home a clear point here of God's ability and desire to provide? I mean, pond is in there five times in one verse. All, everything, as much as you can possibly imagine, and then some, because we can't even imagine how powerful God is and how full of grace, how good he is, and how much he desires to spread that to his people, to give that to his people so generously. So again, pante, pantote, pasan. 
so that in every way, always, I like the way the HESB says it. That's a pretty good way to say it in English. Uh, the the, the uh, King James says it well here, too. It doubles up on the all. Panto, pante, pantote, pasan. So that in every moment and in every way, there's no time that's off limits, and there's no way that's off limits to God when it comes to pouring out His provision. And then you get to this word, and it kind of, kind of brings it all together. It's the next word after the word we were just looking. Artakian. Artakian means contentment. I would ask you to raise your hand, but I don't want to embarrass you. How many of you this morning walked in here, sat down, and feel truly content, which is at peace with who you are and what you have, is what it is to be content. Contentment. Having all of one's needs, sufficiency, a perfect condition of life in which no aid or support is needed. Artakian, very cool Greek word. According to the Tyndale commentary, the meaning of the word Artakian, uh, it's translated as enough or sufficiency. It, it has been used in ethical discussions from the time of Socrates or Socrates, depending on your generation. <laughs> Somebody got that good. Socrates, that's 400s BC, okay? 400, a little over 400 years before, uh, before Christ is walking the earth and before uh, Paul writes this letter, this word is being used in ancient Greek, Autarchian, Autarchian. And it's used uh, by Socrates and then by Cynic and Stoic philosophers after him, uh, at, at, like Seneca. So Seneca would have used this, and Seneca was alive during Paul's lifetime. So that this, this is how long this has been going on. He's a contemporary of Paul. They understood Artakian as that the proud independence of outward circumstances and of other people which constituted true happiness. Did you catch that? It's the proud independence in their minds, in the, in the Stoics and the ancient Greeks. It is the proud independence from outward circumstances and of other people, which constitutes true happiness. It sounds kind of American to me. If you just have enough and you work hard enough, you ain't got to depend on nobody. That's not what the scripture says, though. And that's not the point Paul's trying to make. He took a very well-known Greek word and flipped it from you thinking you are independent by having enough stuff to realizing where the stuff and the things and the true contentment comes from. Paul used the word very differently. For him, Artakian denoted not a self-sufficiency, but the sufficiency provided by God's grace. He completely changed the way this word would have been used. And as such, it's made possible not independence of others, but the ability to abound in good works towards others. Completely different mindset. And I promise you, if you think you can reach the Stoic version, the, the, the Cynic version, the Socrates version, the Seneca version of Autarkian, if you think that if you can just get enough stuff and enough status to finally find contentment in this world, you are going to lead a miserable life. 100%. I can guarantee you that. I would have put every dollar that I own on that. You may go through times of enjoyment, but you will ultimately find yourself to be one miserable person and one miserable person for us to be around as well. So what do we have so far? God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, Autarkian, having everything you could possibly need, finding a true contentment in that. Moving on in the Greek. So y'all didn't know you were getting a Greek lesson this morning, did you? Welcome to my Greek, ancient Greek class. <laughs> this word here, I've highlighted it in both places. So where we just were, you can see Autarkian is the, is the first word on the fourth line. That's where we just were. And that word after it that we skip just means to have. So it's kind of, in the English, it gets moved around. And then we had that same word, again, that we had earlier, perisiomo. That's pretty cool. Paul didn't do that on accident. He, first, he says that, that God 
is has grace in abundance to have all that you need, more than enough, overflow, excessive amount to superabound in a quality or in quantity. He was talking about God's grace, and now he turns it, and you see how it's got Tay on the end of it the second time? That's pointing the word towards you, the reader and the listener at the time when this letter would have been read out loud. It's now directed directly to you. Excuse me. So he says, so he says, all, everything, all the time, everything you need. And then it turns it right directly at you. Abundance to you. You would have caught that. Ponte, pon, right? You've got this, you've, you've, you've got this clear turning of the verse towards the purpose of the verse here. It turns from God and who he is and what he's done to us and what's expected of us with all that is given to us. And then it finishes there with three words. You've got pawn again, the fifth time that it's said in this verse. You've got pawn, ergon, agathos, all the good works. Pawn, ergon, agathos. Okay, so enough speaking Greek. It's enough Greek. I don't know if you're tired of it. I'm tired of it. It takes a while for me to get tired of stuff like that, but now I'm tired of it. Let's say it in plain old English. What is it saying? God has all the power and all the grace to give you all that you need all the time so that you can do all the more good deeds and works for others. That's what this verse is telling us about God and about our position as a follower of Christ. God has all the power and all the grace, all the kindness that you could ever possibly need, and then some. He has all of it, and, and the ability, mighty, powerful ability. He has all that, and he wants to give it to you so that you have all that you need, true contentment at all times, so you can do all the more good deeds and works for others. Pa Paul, in one verse, tells us, as a follower of Christ, <laughs> how to be happy. I mean, you could say it like that. That's, that's how to be happy right there. If you could get that verse and understand it and get it deeply planted in your heart, that's how we are happy. We trust a God who has all the power and all the grace and the character to want to give us that so that we can have all that we need. And by having all that we need, we can do all the more good deeds and works for others. But and that's great, okay? He's a God of provision, and not just a provision, but of bountiful provision. He gives more than enough, and that's cool, and that's awesome, and that's a wonderful thing this morning, and that's what we should be thankful for, that he is that God. But I would be going against my own principle here if I didn't keep this verse in context, because you've got to be careful when you just pluck something out of context. This isn't just some random verse on how awesome God is, God is even though God is very awesome. This chapter is about people coming from Macedonia to get the gift to the Christians in Jerusalem who were suffering from the Corinthians. This was something that the, the Corinthians had already eagerly said they wanted to be part of this gift that the churches around Asia Minor were taking up and around Greece were taking up to take back to the Jerusalem Christians, the church in Jerusalem that was suffering. Okay, So Paul is telling them, the last time I was there, you guys, I didn't ask you to be part of this. You guys said you wanted to be part of this. You said you wanted to give to this. So I'm sending some guys ahead of me so that this can be taken care of before I get there. Because if it's not taken, taken care of before I get there, then you may feel like you have to give because I'm there asking for the thing that you had already promised to give in the first place. In other words, you have to give under compulsion or under pressure, right? And Paul didn't want that to happen when he got there. Plus, Paul had been bragging about the Corinthians to the Macedonians. It's all in the letter. You can catch this. This isn't like some, I don't have like some magic pastor book that tells me this stuff. It's just in the scripture. Um, so he's bragging on the Corinthians to the Macedonians. And the Macedonians were, were not near as well off as the Corinthians. Okay? Two different places. But the Macedonians had given to help those in need in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was in a famine at this time and, and times were bad. And so the other churches around the area were taking up, taking up gifts in money to take to them and in food to take to them so they could make it and not starve to death. 
So he's bragged on them to these people. And Paul wants the Macedonians to see the great generosity of the well-off Corinthians now. But he wants to make sure that they don't forget. And then he gets there, and they haven't got this offering together. And then they look bad. Paul looks dumb. And then they're going to have to give this big gift out of compulsion. Because right before the verse that we picked up on today, it says, God loves a cheerful giver. And that's the whole context of that verse. So that's what Paul was saying. He, he didn't want to come and compel them to give. I never want to stand here and beg you and compel you to give. I don't want to do that. And Paul didn't want to do that either. We should give because God has given. That's why we should give. Not because a pastor stands up here and tells you a sad story and tugs on your heartstrings. I can do that, but I don't want to do that. That's not what it's about. That doesn't honor God. God doesn't bless that. God blesses when a cheerful giver gives because a cheerful giver wants to help and wants to do what is right. And a cheerful giver understands what God has given them. So that's the context of this. Okay. So Paul reminds them in this verse that we looked at today, he reminds them right after what we've looked at today, like practical illustrations of, of how God has all and wants to give generously and has given generously and will give generously. He tells them practically using agricultural terms after the verse we've looked at today. And that those that have a generous giving heart will always have what they need. And those that are stingy and ungenerous will never have enough to experience Artarchian. That's the point of what Paul's saying. Paul's saying that generous people experience a level of contentment from God that ungenerous people don't. That's the point of this verse. The, they experience Autarkian, that perfect state of contentment in God. And then Paul makes two final points as we look at a couple more verses. So I guess I lied earlier. I didn't mean to. Well, we're only studying one verse. We're only studying one verse. This is just to make the final points. Okay. So this is picking up in verse 12. We're just going to read through it and, and get a couple of points off of it. Paul says all of that that we just said, and he says... This, this gift that you're giving, it's for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints. This gift you're giving is not just supplying the needs of the saints. The, the, the saints being the same word as holy. The, the people of the church of Jerusalem is who he's referring to. It's not just supplying the needs of the saints, but it's also overflowing. Notice the, that how that keeps coming back up. Overflowing and many acts of thanksgiving to God. They will glorify God for your obedience, for your generosity in giving. To the confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with others through the proof provided by this service. These people that we're going to take this offering to, they are going to overflow and multiply in their thanksgiving and praise to God because you're proving that you're followers of Christ and because you're supplying such a wonderful, generous gift to them in a time of great, great need that they needed this gift. When God's people trust Him to provide and find Artarchian in Him, their generosity and good deeds provide for the needs of others, and in this, it increases the praise, blessings, and thanksgiving to God from others when we help provide needs. The word ministry, that's all it means to help provide for needs. That's all, that's all ministry need, means. God uses you to help bless others and increase the worship of him. Let that hang there for a second. God uses you to help bless others and increase the worship of him. Is there a more noble calling that anyone could have placed on their life than to bless others in times of need and by doing so increase the worship that is taking place of God, the King of the universe. That's worth our time. It's worth our tears. It's worth our effort. It's worth doing things sometimes that are risky. It's worth doing things sometimes that are dangerous. It will provide a, a, a purpose and a meaning to your life that nothing else this world offers can. Don't you want to be part of that? Don't you want to be part of that? I'll finish with two questions in light of all of these things. 
Two questions. Do you want to experience contentment in God? Do you want to expand the blessings and praise of God? If not, then get up right now and walk out. Because I don't want you to be part of this church. Kidding. That's a joke. Not a very good one either because nobody left. Do you... <laughs> Do you want to experience contentment in God, and do you want to expand the blessings and praise of God? Simple answer for those questions. If so, then pray for a generous heart and opportunities to expand your good deeds and trust Him to provide those things and more, because that's what this verse we looked at said today. Pray for a generous heart and opportunities to expand your good deeds and then trust Him to provide what you need and the opportunities you need to be able to do that and trust Him to do that and then then some. I don't know if you've ever prayed for anything similar to that, but God always goes over and abound to answer prayers like that. It's always bigger and better and cooler than you could have come up with yourself when you allow God to work through you to bless others and to expand His kingdom, to expand the worship of Him. So pray for that and then be obedient to the Holy Spirit's prompting to act. That little, small, still voice that says, talk to her. Pay for their meal. Ask them how their day is going. Go sit with him. Go sit with her. And then we go, yeah, that's weird. Surely that wasn't God. He didn't mean that. That's what we do. The Holy Spirit goes, here's your opportunity. And we go, no, nah, probably not today. I mean, next time. I'm surely, I don't think God meant that. He didn't mean that today. That's not what he meant. He didn't mean that. So pray for it. And then when he answers the prayer and gives you the opportunity and the means in which to do something that helps benefit and bless someone, be obedient to the Holy Spirit's prompting. Because, and I'm going to say it one more time, because those who are generous in heart and in deed in their works will always have more than they need. In every way. I don't just mean physical. I mean where it matters more. You'll be content in your heart, which is way more important than having a bunch of stuff. Those who are generous in heart and deed will always have more than they need. And those who are not will never, ever have enough to experience that. So be encouraged today. Be encouraged because Jesus is the one and only God that has all the power and grace to give you all that you need at all times so you can do all the more good deeds and good works for others. So if you have repented of your sins, placed your faith in Christ, and you'd like to join together here at the end when we sing this last song in praise and in worship, if you want to do that through song this morning or at prayer here at the altar during this last song, Awesome. If you're already a follower of Jesus and you want to just be thankful and, be, and you're thankful that you were reminded of his generosity and his benevolence and his good overabounding grace that he wants to give to you and you want to finish up today by worshiping him through song or through prayer, awesome. If you haven't put your faith, your hope, and your trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin and the gift of eternal everlasting life, would you come down today? Here, down here today during this song and pray and make that announcement to the church today so that we can celebrate with you? Would you do that today? Because catch this. The worldly blessings he gives us is great, but catch this. The greatest provision he ever gave was his own blood for the forgiveness of your sin and for the gift of eternal life. And that provision better than anything else he could give us. The rest of it's just icing on the cake, so to speak. So if you haven't ever done that, let today be the day of salvation for you. Father, we come to you today. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. We thank you that you desire to use us, God. It's, a, it's, it's an amazing thing that the God of this universe has chosen human beings to be his vessels and ambassadors for his name, God. You use us to accomplish your will. And we will never find more purpose, meaning, or contentment in this world than by living for that truth, for living for you and, and, and overabounding 
in our good works and good deeds because we trust that you provide all that we need and will give us all that we need in the times that we need them. You say in every way and at all times, Father. We thank you for that this morning. God, if there's anyone today that has business to do with you, would they conduct that business before we leave out of here today? And may we celebrate it together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.